there's a movement around you, within, a gathering of creative forces preparing to be unleashed, visible only to those with an open mind, those who care to look, who know where to find it, dare. Well, this sounds really epic and stuff. It's from um, uh, Interstellar, the soundtrack. And it's basically saying something, not just for me, not just about star travel and that we should aim higher and not just look down in the dirt, but really you know, have ambition. But it's also in terms of what we are doing as an industry. Um, we're selling products to a generation that has become used to, you know, in gaming at least, to save humankind uh, from robot apocalypse and zombies. And um, we're pitching brands to people that are knee deep in an ever changing world where they can take nothing for granted. Everything is changing and in flux. We are offering services in a world where you can get instant satisfaction upon a press of a button. Um, but I think still some people think a TV commercial will cut it or a banner is you know, the latest in tech. That doesn't work anymore. We have so many platforms, we have so many interests, we have personalization, it just doesn't cut it anymore. But maybe if we're bold enough, we can go a step further. And um, for us, this might not be something new to engage into more storytelling, but um, for some of our clients, I think it's still a big challenge and they really have to be brave. So um, we have to encourage more them than us to really go the next step. And um, to do this, and that's my conviction, we should, we have to engage into transmedia storytelling. And uh, for that I have two assumptions. The first assumption is that everyone here in the room, if they like it or not, are wired for experiences. We can't live without it. We can't just make sense of the world if we don't put it into a a context of an experience we have. It's all holistic. We don't go in one direction and that's it. We are not robots. God bless. But that's not my opinion only. That's not a gut feeling. That's also the gut the feeling or the conviction of the company I'm working for right now. Um, we have more than just, you know, ads. We have stories. We have immersive experiences that come from that emotion. And the second assumption I'm doing for this presentation is I think we are all wired for play. We are homo ludens, the, the, the playing human. And um, even though for some this might be lowbrow and not really cultural, you know, playing games or whatever, my conviction is that this is crucial to understanding things in our world. And not just my conviction again, but also this guy again who says, yeah, um, in terms of storyscaping, we have a participatory, participatory, and that's really important, and immersive experience. And you can only participate if it's fun. I mean, you don't participate if you don't like it. So to do this, to realize this, we can go into cross-media storytelling that takes bits of platforms, video maybe, or social, and then kind of copies the story in a format that's proper for that format. And this might then look like this, you know, it, it's cool, it looks cool, but um, it doesn't really make sense. It's not a holistic view of it. And then you can go transmedia, which is, again, you have these pieces of information, but now each piece of information doesn't reflect the entire story, but is maybe just an aspect of the story or maybe just a side character of the story and um, doesn't, you know, replicate the entire story that you're telling. And doing that gives us the chance to, if people connect the dots, give them a feeling that they're immersed into that story, that they have all kinds of aspects known of that story. And uh, Henry Jenkins, one of the people who kind of coined the term, um, put it this way, I won't read it now to you, but basically it says um, that um, 
if you have different media and different channels, you can optimize stories for these channels and the story doesn't have to replicate the entire story, but just an aspect of this that is most suitable to that piece of um, media or channel. And that's really very complicated to really realize, to do this. So lots of people say, okay, that doesn't work. You know, you can't be, you can't make up a whole, you know, patchwork, a whole puzzle set of um, pieces that kind of uh, grip into each other, but on the other hand are standalone versions of tiny stories. It's too complicated. Um, but um, I think it's, it, it does work. And there, there's a lot of proof out there that, you know, people have done it this already. Um, but... Um, for me, for me personally, I always had the gut feeling that it's working, but um, I kind of started to hold presentations like this one uh, about this topic. But uh, people said, okay, it's really cool stuff and it really sounds nerdy and, you know, but it's too complicated. Our client won't understand it. And, um, you know, actually, honestly, I think we are not really capable of doing this and it's all not working. And we can't do it just by ourselves. We need this and we need this and we need this and we need those and people and production, blah, blah, blah. So I was kind of sick of it and I said, okay, screw all this, um, I'm just creating a kind of minimal viable product for um, a transmedia story. I'm just doing it myself. Um, if nobody you know, wants to join, then I just do it myself. And it's funny because um, uh, I didn't really know what I was getting into. I was just starting from scratch and um, trying to um, do something like a proof of concept, basically, of the whole thing. And that means, uh, like, okay, I, I wanted to be very humble, uh, do a very small version of a story I would like to tell, maybe more in the, to the direction of an alternate reality game, so people get immersed into the story if they want to or not, you know, in their daily lives. And um, I was basically focusing on my colleagues uh, at the agency I was working at to, you know, um, create a small version of something actually really big. Um, so I, I'm a little bit ashamed to do this, to say this, but I used them as kind of as a guinea pigs uh, for my test run. But um, I had the best intentions. <laughs> um, so I um, started out um, to kind of plan this a little bit. So, but very humble, very small, <laughs> and um, not really, you know, uh, yeah, it looks not humble, but that's not a picture of my board, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I set a different goals, four goals. First, um, I would have, uh, at that time, I wanted to create a team that's kind of going with me on that journey later on, once the prototype was done, once the, the minimal viable product was done, and um, kind of join me to really collaborate to write a cool story, like a big story. Like um, I would have a guy from our agency that is perfect in video editing, a story writer, maybe a concept person, a designer, so forth. So far, it was just me, so it didn't really work. So that's why I needed a team. So team building was one of the top priorities as a goal. Then um, I wanted to create a mechanism by which those who were in the team acquired new team members and got themselves out of the loop again. So this way, it kind of refreshed and regenerated all the time. So the team wasn't stuck in the status quo and trying to, you know, save their space and their job in that team, but, you know, be free. Go like, okay, you found out about our team, so why, do, why don't you just go into my position? I just kind of recline and go back, uh, go out of the team. So it's a con constant refreshing of the team. And then I wanted to motivate people um, to inspire their colleagues while they were in that game. So they were supposed to take out the learnings or the, the inspiration they got from the game and put it into their teams where they were working at that time. And my approach was to have all of this in a very playful manner. I don't like to, like I'm standing here right now talking to you, but that's not the perfect way for me actually to, to, to communicate and to transfer knowledge. Um, I think in a gameful and playful way, it's much easier and people you know, get this stuff more intuitively and more by heart than just by uh, your, your, your brains. Um, and then I had, um, of course, um, a strategy, but as I said, humble, very small strategy. I wanted to create awareness, then um, curiosity for those people who got aware of the topic to dig in deeper into the story. Then I wanted to motivate them um, by giving them kind of, you know, like a like a benefit, if you dig deeper and if you put the effort into decoding this and that, then you get more chunks of the story. So it's a give and take. I give them a um, quest and they kind of pick up the challenge, resolve the quest, and for this they get more uh, spoon-fed story tidbits. And of course I wanted to realize my goals. So um, 
what I basically created was what I called um, Project Chaos Crew. And um, the symbol was taken, uh, that's again a very ad hoc approach. I just went onto the web and looked around and I thought, thought this symbol looks cool. And then I kind of researched what it's all about and it's about, about chaos magic. So, um, and chaos magicians basically believe that what they are doing they are a little bit, you know, tongue in cheek all the time. They're not really taking themselves too seriously, like I did with this project, of course. But they also think they think that, um, you know, the world around them is kind of would behave in a way that they want it to behave. They kind of they can influence their surroundings, and basically, in a small scale, that's true. I mean, if you're in a conversation with a person, you might convince him or her of another opinion, and booms, you change the world around you. So it's kind of true, but truish, more or less. And uh, I like the symbol, and it helped, you know, keep the, the story driving, as we see, out, see find out later. Um, and then I kind of got a small draft of how I would like all this be in a conceptual uh, way, how that should behave. So first, create awareness and curiosity to deep uh, dive into the story. Then I kind of split my colleagues into people who basically were in that team, and they kind of tried snowballing the, 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 the um, members of the team. They trying to uh, get new people in the team. And the people who weren't in that story, um, but who were interested in, hey, what are you guys are doing there? I mean, can I join? It's kind of like, oh, a secret circle or something? What are you doing? And they were kind of, and I come to that later, kept saying what they were doing. It's kind of a, keeping things a bit of a mystery, you know, like J.J. Abrams always talks about this, you know, box which, no, like a MacGuffin, where nobody knows what's inside, but people make a big mystery out of it. And that's what I tried to do with this uh, system. And then, of course, the whole thing was my little minimal viable project, um, uh, Chaos Crew. So that's kind of the package that I got. And now I just want to show you stuff that I kind of produced while doing this and try to kind of retell you the story um, Hold on, that, that I was uh, talking uh, about. If I find this. Uh, ah, okay. Got a little piece of paper here. Because it's really, I just took down notes how things went to the other. Like, um, it's like a string of pearls, and one pearl leads to the other. And I'm just reading down things so you can kind of, kind of get a grip of what I was doing. I created a video that led to a QR code that led to a website that I faked, that was the former Ogilvy website, but I faked it and it looked like I, I hacked it. Then I um, put a video with R2D2 there that led to a paper, a piece of paper that was put in our boss's um, apartment, um, not apartment, but uh, bureau. That led to a QR code that led to a Tumblr web page that led to an email contact people could contact and get a website going that I created with Aksha that looks really real but wasn't, and they could hack the login because they had all the hints. That led to a story that was telling them on the site. The story led to a team building that led to a real, in life, real person meeting uh, where they didn't meet me, but a USB stick that told them a video about what was happening. So they had to decide to continue or review the entire story. So in a nutshell, that was it. Totally crazy, I know, but that's how it worked. <laughs> The funny thing was that I was part of that team. And as they told me later on, in the beginning, they said, that's so crazy. So everybody thought it was you, Arno, who did it. But then during the process of the story, they said, OK, that's so much over the top, that can't be you. So it's, it must be somebody else. So I was kind of a you know, listener in that team. And that's highly valuable for us you know, as a learning. If you are really listening close, like social listening, da, 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 listening to how people receive, um, get your story, you can react immediately and change you know, the course of the story, even though you have set waypoints, of course, but adapting in real time to what people are saying is pure gold. And I really learned to appreciate this while I was doing it. And um, being part of the team was also fun because I could see immediate reactions like if things happened. So um, creating awareness. So that was the first thing. Um, I did this with a, a plain Facebook, uh, oh, sorry, uh, too fast. Uh, I did this with a plain Facebook um, post. So do has, I, I was also in our team, that was my account. And I kind of you know, acted like, oh, something um, was sent and uh, oh, interesting, um, you know, welcome to the circle. I kind of contacted some people I knew from my agency. Um, they at that time didn't know that do has was me. Um, and I kind of tried to create awareness. So I kind of um, I created this video, 
And in this video, the symbol appeared for the first time, the chaos magic symbol. And one of the guys who, were, who was working with me figured that out. So he took a screenshot of that picture and um, you know, uploaded it as a comment. And I just want to show you the video that I showed. Well, now listen carefully, my dear. Prepare for unforeseen consequences. And that was it. I mean, nothing more, just a little blip, <laughs> and that's it. And it's interesting because sometimes, and again, I go to the client discussion, clients think, or they say, oh, you know, that's too complicated, that's too small, they won't see it, it doesn't happen. The trick is to distribute lots of these little, you know, hints everywhere. And, you know, one or the other will, you know, grip, and then from that you tell the story. Um, so I think I have to go 20 or 30 minutes, <laughs> Manuela? Yeah, about 30. 30, okay, great. So, um, I uh, did another thing uh, in our former agency. This here is a uh, big monitor in the beginning, in the uh, entrance hall of um, the place where I was working. So a big thing, clients, everybody goes through there and it's kind of a promotional video for the agency. And it has a USB stick in the back. So um, I took a look and they had a surveillance camera there as well. So that was kind of tricky. So I went there, I took out the stick and rechanged it with an uh, edited video of my version of the you know, commercial for the agency. And that commercial had uh, three times that symbol, you know, flipped in there. So people looked at it and I saw when I arrived in the morning with my colleagues, um, I saw them looking at this thing and they kind of got a little bit, did I see this or didn't I see this? So they were kind of thinking like something went wrong here. And the funny thing is our IT department, uh, because when I plugged the pl uh, stick in there again, it didn't right away start the video. So I called our IT department and told them, guys, something is wrong with the display. Can you just check on that? And they just, you know, restarted it as a remote and it was running. I said, you know, thank you. And they didn't even know what they were doing. <laughs> and so it's, you know, a one man show, not all the time. There was one thing, because I'm obviously not the tallest person. Our elevator had a kind of milk glass on top and I, put, I wanted to put the symbol on top of it so people could see it shining through. And um, I couldn't reach it, so I had to call our, um, you know, uh, housemeister, the guy. And uh, he helped me, but he said, okay, so many, I won't say anything. And he didn't, so um, that was cool. Um, so that was all the awareness phase, um, basically. There were already some papers uh, uh, here and there and some other videos. I won't show you that because too much time. But um, then I introduced um, a little bit more, and that's now the... Uh, motivational part. Now, curiosity and awareness was taken already. I mean, people knew the symbol, they were diving into the story, and, uh, and into the, it's not really a real story at that point, it's more narrative, like, okay, there's something happening, but you don't know what, and blah, 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 a little bit mystery. And that was my kind of very humble uh, extra page with the symbol again and a login. And those who got the clues until that moment were really able, I think, or capable to, to hack the login. So it was a username and password they had to know. And that's what you know, they were kind of given, not obviously, but in a kind of tarnished way. Um, and it, uh, I mean, they worked it. And for me, the interesting part is that there were um, two designers who always told me, you know, Arnold, the, all the internet and computer stuff, I'm too old for this, and it's not really my cup of tea and so forth. But they were sitting there from uh, six to eight o'clock at night trying to hack that page, looking into the source code. And I was like, wow, what are you doing? I mean, they never, they never looked at source code you know, first, and that was kind of interesting for me. And again, I think by you going in a playful manner about the topic, people learn all kinds of stuff they wouldn't think they would like to learn. Um, I created a Tumblr web page where I kind of uh, hit, put some hints in there again, uh, particularly this one here, it says, are you curious? And then there's a first email address, and this is how people who send an email to that address got an auto-reply with uh, additional hints. And I set up this email address at GMX um, with a fake uh, trash email they could, I could throw away so they couldn't, you know, follow my path back. So I really felt like a little bit, you know, like a secret agent doing stuff. Um, and funny enough, I had some connections left to other agencies, so I asked them friendly to post the symbol in context with their agency names, and they did it. So it got the appearance that this is a, not just reserved to Ogilvy, where I was working at that time, but to all agencies or many agencies. And that was kind of, ooh, scary, like, what's going on? <laughs> and... Um, this is the website I kind of faked. I just took a screenshot and put the logo up here and they could click it. And um, some people, the IT department again, when all this was over, they told me that some people approached them that somebody hacked the web page. So it's, 
wow, I wouldn't have expected this. Uh, yeah, but um, I posted this video on that website behind the link, and it was a direct link to a real life event an event that um, was a little robot, a toy robot like this, with a piece of paper under his arm in our um, CEO's um, office room. And it was uh, ringing at a special time. And they got you know, um, aware of that and took it out. And there was the next hint on that paper. So it was a transfer into the real life from digital. And that's a lot of fun. Um, the funny thing is that while doing this, there were, as I said, lots of input things. Like at that point, our CEO said um, at that time, you know, I don't think that's a local thing. I think that's uh, WPP doing this. And I think it's a kind of uh, HR um, campaign. So they find out, you know, who's like really creative and stuff. And I heard this, him saying, so in the next video, I included a QR code, like a blip again, which showed the um, geo coordinates of WPP in London. And they were like, I told you, I told you it's there. <laughs> you know, and it's like, yes, the story continues. And that's so cool about transmedia storytelling. You can include the feedback of your, you know, your audience immediately and you know, empower their perspective on the game and on the story. And that's a lot of fun for, for you as a uh, creator, but also I think for the people who kind of try to figure stuff out. So uh, 23 minutes, I have to be a bit quicker now. Um, so that's all copy I put on the web page. And I did tons of videos as well. And in the end, there was a team, you see my name here as well. I told, put myself into the team, of course, uh, as I said, but um, these people were in the team. And I asked them to change their icon, uh, their, their avatar on Facebook. So they include this little, you know, uh, star, this chaos symbol. So whoever organized this knew they were in. So that's what they actually did. That's awesome. And um, then there was a kind of membership um, uh, video that I published on that secret website that only they had access to. Uh, and that's what I want to show you. that the, the uh, lyrics are from a, a hip-hop album, the, the clouds are from somewhere YouTube, and the copy is by me, Woo. but everything else just by them uh, is, you know, remix. And it was uh, because I had nobody, you know, to do the video editing, I did it myself at night. But um, the interesting thing is this led the people, of course, to the 1st of April, which is kind of, ah, so it's all a joke, they said. And what the promise of that page and of that video was, okay, the maker of that story would meet the team in the flash. Um, on the 1st of April. So, and they had to go out in front of the agency with a, totally ridiculous actually, with a piece of paper holding the symbol over their heads. 
So they're all serious creatives and you know, they, they would never do this, but they did because it's a gripping story. It's, you know, excitement. They go like, ah, you know, what, what, what will happen if we see the person in the flesh? And they were totally excited because I was in the team. I knew who, would they, who they would meet. Um, and, um, oh, here you see by, uh, does it work? Yeah, here you see the elevator thing where I didn't get up. Uh, so that's kind of, I call it POS because it's in the real world stuff. And then you see the team that kind of got together uh, in the CEO's office and they were totally amazed and like, what's happening, da, 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 kind of. And the greatest thing for me also was there were two uh, uh, copywriters who um, were really cool buddies and so, but, uh, and they were both in the story, they were both in the team. And at one point there was a photo op that I'm coming to later. And um, one of the persons wasn't there because he had to go to a shoot. But the team took the photo shooting anyways for this organizing person, this entity. And um, so they got in a verbal fight because of the game in the office. And there was never any name calling or yelling in our office, never. I've never seen this in four and a half years I was working there. And on the outside, I was like, guys, you know, calm down, you know, it's not so bad. But inside, I was laughing my head off because amazing, this is emotions. The game is really, you know, pushing people forward, almost like, you know, the wave. People are going totally into it, which was cool. Um, <laughs> but then again, there was this meeting and there was an anonymous person I just picked up a couple of hours before and I asked, he was not working for the agency, and I asked him to pick up pizza at a place nearby and bring it at a special time to the front door of the office. And with it, please bring the USB stick where I put a video on. And it's like the final message to the team, um, which I will show you in a minute. And the funny thing is, the guy, I, put, I gave him some tip, of course, because he was doing this. And I told him, if anyone asks you who gave you the order, you just tell him, it's an old man with a long beard. <laughs> you know, it was funny because I'm not so old, I don't have that long beard. But, you know, just to you know, tip them off into a different direction. Because I didn't want to tell them right away in front of the door, hey guys, I did it, hada, which is kind of a downer, I guess. So I wanted to keep it a little bit more uh, um, exciting. And the video you're going to, about to see is kind of the final video I sent. There were some videos after this as well I created because the team, as I said, wasn't complete and it was important to have eight people because the access is like eight you know, persons in the wheel, so forth, it had all you know, connections. And the thing is, I made this up while I was going along. It's not something I planned in the beginning, but I had just my goals and my strategy, but these are things I created while I was doing it. And that kind of made the whole thing really uh, lively. So this is the final product. And, uh, of course, there are video editors in here. I'm not one of them. So please bear with me. It's not professional stuff. It's humble. It's a minimal viable product. I wish I could be with you today in the flesh, as they say. Unfortunately, I'm in India. Ever been in India? Very hot. You don't mind, I'm going to take off my coat. Thank you for triggering this event. Curious ones. If everything went as planned, you are watching my final call to you right now. As you can see from the people around you, your success has not gone unnoticed. In fact, as you will find out soon, the Chaos Crew is not a singular phenomenon. Some may even call it a movement already with branches across the country. But let's not brag about my humble achievements in this matter. This call is about you, and you alone. And to be honest, I have always trusted in you. I knew you would hear my calling. I knew you would have the brains and hearts to follow my words and deeds. I knew that one day, I would be able to have crafted a genuinely superior team, the Chaos Crew. So, first and foremost and without further much ado I want to congratulate you to this greatest achievement of yours. You have found each other, you bonded, each of you comprised a very unique skill set. Equipped with this skill set and your fellow crew members I want to set you on a mission, a threefold mission. But before I will tell you about the goals of these missions let's take the time to have a look back. It all started two weeks ago. I sent out a message through my proxy on Facebook and, poor fool, he didn't even know what he really posted. The irony, 
posting links about sock puppets would eventually trigger a game about identity, self and questions about both with regards to authenticity, lies and finally even betrayal. Two days later it was still fun end games as my proxy posted a mysterious video about unforeseen consequences. As my symbol appeared in the video, some of you started thinking, asking, questioning. I caught your attention. Inviting you for contemplation by quoting one of my favorite thinkers I let you look behind the curtain. Something you had seen for ages, each day passing suddenly became something anew. You saw the clues in the video and started to look even harder. Oh, did I mention the elevator? Yes, I know, pretty obvious and not really your leak, I know. But still the sign in the elevator was talked about by most of my prospects. But I wanted to go further, wanted to see how far you would follow me into the rabbit hole. And those of you who are watching this right now, truly went the extra mile. So actually on March 23rd I decided to change the rules, tweak what would have otherwise become pretty predictable. It's a shame that my prospect left his laptop unattended. I hijacked do hast, posted a hint and left him dumbfounded as he returned. But not having the guts to delete the entry he kept posting as if nothing happened. The video hinted you towards a fake Ogilvy homepage with my logo in the upper right. Clicking it sent you to a video of R2D2 doing his thing. In the night of March 24th I put out my invitation to you, my chaos crew, in hopes that I would gather all eight of you. And it worked. You kept following, solved mysteries, cracked codes, you started seeing. You started to change your perspective. You started to believe in me. You woke up to see the symbolism of the mediocre being turned into shining prospects of things to come. Awakened as you are now, you were free to feel, free to see, free to hear the beckoning sound of a new promise. The final step was to show your allegiance to the Chaos Crew. The rest, as they say, is history. But why? Why? You might ask. Why did I do this? What were the goals? Do we always need reason? Can't we just circumvent the concept of cause and effect? But I know this wouldn't quench your thirst for answers. So here we go. I set out with three goals. First goal, put together the most curious, most brilliant, smartest and knowledge hungry team which also still dares to dream and think the unthinkable. I needed a team that would bring back the magic to our corporation, a team that would cut through the daily clutter and would be inspired by real vision. Second goal, get this team to infuse their colleagues with their newfound strengths. Third goal, convince the Chaos crew to set up an even more elaborate team finding scheme for the next generation of Chaos Seekers, get them to pass the torch. You see. I succeeded in realizing my first and most important goal, getting the team together. The second and third goal is now up to you my friends. I promised you to meet me in the flesh. Well, it is a little more complicated than that, actually. So who is this person, the one that keeps rambling on to you about the chaos within? If you're looking for the guilty, you need only look into a mirror. Because what happened, only happened because it was your idea, your input, feedback and eventually your will. Me? I was nothing more than a conduit empowered by your will, to have the story continued, to let the saga live another day. The chaos within clearly lives within all of you. Within yourselves there is a source of great strength, of persistence, idealism and all these habits David once told you about. Side note, he was actually one of my first apprentices. So, there you have it, all truth spelled out for you, nice and tidy. What's left to do now? It's up to you. You have two choices. Choice A. You decide to break the age-old cycle of chaos crews by publishing your findings and this video to all your colleagues. I will vanish and never return. Choice B. You decide to continue the cycle of the Chaos Crew by acting as if nothing had happened. Just tell your colleagues that the game just stopped. In secret, prepare the stage for the next set of Chaos Magicians. 
create a new game to summon the next generation of the Chaos Crew. But before you decide anything, please take a second to send me a picture of your crew for my archives. I put lots of effort into finding you, so give me a brief moment to remember in return. I would be glad to put your picture to my archive of other Chaos Crews. As I have stated earlier, there were others before you and there are others all across the country as we speak, just like you. So, this is the truth. Nothing but the truth. From now on, it is all in your hands. You have changed throughout this journey. I am proud of every single one of you. You are the living proof that we can restart our ambitions, goals and focus each day anew. I'll be watching you. Oh, okay. So, um, what's becoming pretty obvious is that you put a lot of, you know, you're kind of patting people on the shoulder. You're telling them, hey, you saved the world. You know, that's what I said in the beginning of the presentation. It's not so much about little, you know, successes, but hey, you become part of something really important and, you know, you're going further and the choice is yours. All these things, these open ends, these loose ends that I'm creating here. And the thing is, now they started, they uh, in Düsseldorf, where I was working there, there was Think right next door, and they were planning on putting hints in their bathrooms and creating a team within Think. So they were really going the next step. At that point, I kind of cut in and had a presentation of this stuff and showed it to everybody, and they almost wanted to lynch me after that. <laughs> but um, basically, they said, well, that's, that was quite a riot. And uh, uh, some of them said, okay, now I think we get more the idea of where you wanted to head. Last thing, my learnings, and then I conclude because time is already up. Um, I still have the other cases, but... Go to the question okay, perfect. Okay, so just my learnings, and then I finish here. Um, first of all, you can do something like this. That's basically my humble personal opinion, of course. There might be others who think different, but my opinion is that you can plan this on a drawing board, but then you have to be prepared to cut everything in half and do something new. But it's good to have a basic idea of where you want to go. Um, then, as I emphasized a lot of times during this talk, uh, you have to re-evaluate the whole thing all the time, 24-7. Um, and you have to be very bold in what you're doing, because once you it's out there, it's out there, and people will work with that piece of the story you're publishing. So be very bold, and you will be wrong at a couple of times, but then you have to stick to this and maybe you know, turn the story a little bit so the wrong seems right afterwards. You know, it's kind of a tricky thing. Um, then you have to be flexible in your story approach um, and how you, how you go about it. Um, you have to, and that's, I think, also the fun part, you have to adapt the content to play a reaction and progression in the story. Um, and sometimes that was also true. Um, you think something's really cool, but then the feedback is, man, that's way too scary now. There was one um, uh, um, designer, and she uh, told me at one point when the email addresses got back and forth, I know that guy has our email addresses, now what? You know, and I was like, I don't know. Or maybe he's a pervert from the internet. And I said, maybe he is, maybe he's not. So then I had to kind of uh, go back a little bit again and uh, say, okay, maybe it's all fine. And I had to tell, uh, adjust the story a little bit again. Um, you can, as I said, correct errors once you were wrong, maybe with a better story or with a different story. Um, and you can, I think, totally do this on your own in a small way, like in a very humble small way as I presented it to you. It's working, and I'm also pretty sure that if you have a tight team that's 100% dedicated to something like this, this will actually work in a bigger scale way as well. Um, but you need really experts in different fields for that, like, you know, as I said, video, design, you know, all these things with, that we're doing, basically. But you need people who are 100% or 1,000% behind this and who understand the vision of the whole thing. Um, but, again, you need partners in crime, like my uh, housemeister, there's also in the public sphere, of course, there might be press, you know, or media that you need kind of to get into the game. So they, you know, talk about this a little bit different as well and who know maybe the backstory. Um, and before you put something out, you really have to check that this is correct. I had so many things that went wrong, like uh, email addresses that were put, sent to the wrong people and they sent me back mails like, what's this doing with my daily life? And so th there were things, I, that was horrible. But I learned that you have to think, uh, to check this at least twice before you send it out, like every good work, I guess. Um, oh, and a really cool learning, 
I don't know if you can read it in the back, but if, if the story, not store, if the story is right, people are even inclined to use QR codes. Wow. <laughs> They will, definitely. I mean, there was something I was always very uh, you know, critical of, QR codes, oh, jeez, show me the website where people use QR codes, the one, everybody knows it. But I found out, hey, if the story is right and if you include them, for example, in a video, something like this, people are you know, going frame by frame to find that stupid QR code and scan it to go further in the story to progress. Um, and a very strange thing, boldness. Um, I started out with a very small premise, but I figured out the more absurd and big and yeah, bold the whole thing gets, the more it's accepted. It's strange. Maybe it's a, it has a matter of you know, suspension of disbelief that people want to go into a story that's a little bit way more fictional than they want it to be. I don't know. But um, the, the more crazy I went and the more over the edge I went with the other agencies and then WPP and all that stuff, the more they said, okay, this can't be a thing one person did here. This must be something great. And wow, that's really cool. It's interesting. So um, that's kind of a takeaway for me that was most surprising to me. The bolder you become, the more it works, basically, which is cool. So we can have a lot of creative power put into these kinds of stories we're telling in a transmedia fashion. Okay, I took too much time already. Thank you for listening and uh, have fun. So, Q and A. Yeah, very fascinating topic. If any of you have questions, now's the time. We'll do it for about ten minutes. <coughs> yeah. Thank you for your interesting talk. I have a question. You said this was a small project and yeah. it could be big, but uh, for me it seemed very. Um, there was how much time do you invest in it? Yeah, that's the thing. Um, I have a wife, and at that time I did this, she was pretty angry at me because I didn't go to bed with her when I came from work, but I sat at the computer and was working at the night. So that's how I end the weekends. There was plus time, not agency time, basically. Because the thing was I wanted to prove that this stuff is amazing and that people are longing for these stories, especially people who are used to fragmented you know, channels and, and uh, media uh, platforms. It's, it totally makes sense. And people, are, I just researched a little bit again in the course of that presentation, and there's a, um, I think, Swiss uh, alternate reality game. It's called Polder or Der Polder, which is also amazing. And it's an art project, but it's uh, transmedia at its best. They have an app for that and all kinds of, I mean, it's amazing. So once you go bigger, of course, yeah, then it's, it takes some time. And as I said, if you have a small, dedicated team that has quick decision-making options, I think it works quite well. Even in a smaller team, it's even, I think, better. But yeah, it's, of course, it's work. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but I think if you're in a flow, and you're in a good flow, like almost every creative has once in a while, then you don't care about time because it's just, you know, wow, I'm developing this story and they're going with me. You know? The greatest thing for me was how the people who were playing with me were going with that story. And they were totally, you could see that they were invested in that story. And that was something so gratifying for me that I don't, didn't care that I do a bit more work. It's just, it helps really to push you yourself. To. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear the beginning. Was it a critical topic that they played during their work time? Yeah, was it a critical topic they played during their work time? Yes, they played it also during the work time, yes. Um, but then again, like as I said, after work, like after six o'clock, uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> we all know. But then, um, yeah, they, they hacked source code. I mean, they looked at source code. Designers that didn't want to hear about source code when I um, you know, approached them before that game. So. Um, <laughs> It's kind of an intrinsic thing, and that's what I'm trying to tell our clients all the time. It's intrinsic value you're bringing to, to the people. Yeah, but there has to be a Gewinnspiel. I said, no, you don't have to win something externally. You, it's here, you know, in here. It's, the story is in your head. That's why I showed you, uh, let's listen to you, the sound file in the beginning, because the story is happening here. And then you go, you know, out and figure out how things are working. Yeah, did you have any thoughts about how it would work if you scaled it to maybe an audience of several thousand people, like <coughs> out on the internet in the open and 
Yeah, actually, that was the part when they started to infiltrate the other agency. I was very, I was thinking about this, and I actually talked to my wife about this because it took on its own momentum at that point. Uh, and I said, no, I stop it because it was a little product, mineral by product. But they were totally into. They were also talking to me then about um, one uh, uh, throwaway uh, mobile phones they could place in the city, so people, you know, could call them and stuff. So they really started to generate more ideas and more ideas. Uh, and I, I hope I left some, you know, um, breadcrumbs there that they're using in their daily work now. Um, but yeah, I think you could scale it. And we were also talking about, you know, including little secret codes in our real advertising work here and there. And if we split in different agencies sooner or later, we again start this stuff. And people who are watching advertisements suddenly connect the dots and find that there's a secret message running through, you know, television and computer and so forth, which would be awesome. But um, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you could scale. You could scale as far as a, as a uh, very um, uh, basic to say, but as far as your imagination takes you, basically, and as far as you are willing to put work into it, of course. Yeah. Um, how sustainable was it? So, uh, a uh, in terms of how the mind change in your colleagues had. So, did they work differently afterwards, and did they use what they have learned in other campaigns that have been successful? Yeah. Then? Um, good question. I think the first part could be a clear yes. The second part is a very long thing. Um, and that's, I, I didn't mention this in the beginning of this presentation, but committing yourself to a form, a story form in this way, from my point of, humble point of view, I always have to say because I'm not the professional, but I just had an experience with that, is that um, it is a long, very long-term commitment, also from your client. It doesn't pay off immediately. It's like a good wine. You have to really let it, you know, be, lie down and... Uh, you know, start to activate in situations where people think, ah, you know, at that time I did this and that. But direct feedback was, well, that was awesome, let's do something like this again. So it is sustainable and it's in their mindsets. And also the people who weren't in that group um, kind of sometimes even told me afterwards, oh, that was unfair that you left us out. But I did it on purpose. I wanted to keep it small, not scalable, huh? but small. And I didn't want to be best friends with everybody. I said, okay, target audience, you know, these eight people, and I totally commit myself and the story to these eight people, and I make this story for them something they experience day and night. And that was my commitment for a couple of weeks. So yeah, but I, I hope that it's taking, you know, it's taking foot in the long term. Yeah, I hope. That would be great. And that's why I'm holding the speech also to inspire you guys and girls to do this, because it's, I think it's really worth it. Um, Right now, in our agency, we are working on similar things, you know, in that direction. So, yeah, there are application forms. Whoever wants to do something <laughs> like this, join me and you do something great. Yeah. Anything else? Um, do you think it's easy to transform the whole concept to an idea that has a commercial background? I mean, now we ah, have like mm -hmm. a thing like you meant the intrinsic yeah. thing. So, of course, the get into a secret that's maybe something that makes you very excited but yeah. once you have like a product or a commercial interest behind it I think there might be a challenge to keep this energy up. Definitely. It's always, uh, it depends on how long you play it. Um, this for example is definitely commercial. It's a movie and everybody knows the three movies but not a lot of people know that there were three computer games with this and uh, a DVD with animations, eight episodes. And they're all interlinked with each other. Um, and they all had their respective place in the transmedia construct that was The Matrix. It wasn't just uh, one great movie and two shitty ones. It was a great thing. <laughs> and the, th the same in terms of, oh, and there was, of course, fan movies and uh, fan uh, fiction. Um, I go through that. And there's another example, because long term, that's, I think, your point for commercial product. Um, this one here is pretty interesting. It's The Secret World, a computer game, and they had an augmented, uh, an alternate reality game for that as well, which was short term. But then the um, creators, Alison Smith, figured out that this was so successful that was the alternate reality game was even more successful than the launch of the computer game that they did the alternate reality game for. <laughs> so basically what the agency that did this did, they totally switched their course. They didn't do advertising anymore, but they do alternate reality gaming in the sense of, I don't know if you know the movie The Game, and they do this for real. So they have really, uh, you know, health checks on people and psychological checks, and they take part in a global game of secret agents of the supernatural, and that's the Black Watchman. And it's a standalone commercial alternate reality game transmedia story that they're keeping 
continuing over um, episodes that last six months. So it's a semester per episode. You can buy these season passes and then for you know, 19 euros or something on Steam. And then you continue that adventure with the global community that is growing almost by the hour. So, um, but it's totally time consuming and I wouldn't recommend this because you lose your job and everything, so don't do it. <laughs> but, but it's amazing. I, it's, a, it's an experience, really. It's off and online and you get really approached by people. There are even kidnappings happening, which are a game, but that are still happening. It's, it's crazy stuff. Uh, but this is long term, for example. Or um, the last one uh, is Ingress, uh, which is basically a handheld uh, smartphone game with uh, geo-positioning. It's kind of a, um, a treasure hunt, basically very rough. But they had comics for this, official comics. They had a book that's a pre-story. And the whole thing started in, I think, uh, late 2013. And the transmedia story that they're telling is still continuing today. Um, but um, so they're fan art here. They have the game, obviously. They have uh, art, an art book for that as well. But the story is still continuing today. And they keep on, they're continuing the story, writing, writing, writing. And there are people who are interested, like me, basically, in the story side of that game. And there are hardcore gamers who just take the mobile phone and take the app and walk into the, through the city. It's the predecessor of Pokemon Go. Mm -hmm. so, and um, so that's really something as a long-term commitment, but it of, of course costs a lot of money too, you know, to keep that running. And that's sometimes where clients kind of fall backwards down and say, oh my gosh, I, I, don't, I don't pay that if I don't really know what it's happening. And the thing is, lots of clients say, so show me who has done that in my business before and it works. If you can show me this, then I'm all with you. The thing is, as I said in the beginning, or as I showed you with the little audio file, these are frontiers, this pioneering stuff. And we are pioneering, not in terms of movies, games, and books. Uh, alternate reality games and transmedia storytelling has been done in these sectors. But what if you would have to promote, I don't know, something totally boring, like um, a, a, a research result by a company, and you have to put a whole transmedia story around it as a kind of trap to trap people emotionally into the dry, dreary story. It's a longer commitment, and then you have to argue with your clients, is that working, is that not working? It's really tough. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think that's all 10 o'clock, oh geez, today. okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. moves around from space to space. We have different hosts, different speakers. We will be here again at Safety at Nitro next month, uh, the last Friday of next month. So come back again and stay tuned on social media. We'll post more information next time. But have a great Friday. Enjoy your long weekend. Thank you. Thank you.